I can kind of chat about whatever, really whatever people want. I didn't have a particular, um, Sandy and I had just chatted who runs the bakery, you guys know, um, about just having a talk from the book to see kind of what local people were interested in, what aspects they wanted to um, know more about, uh, not just of the book, but of any of the topics. Um, so really, I'd kind of, in some ways, it could be a pretty open format of q and A. I I don't want to just like sit and read, you know, something anyone else can read, you know. That's not really my main approach. Um, but I also don't have, you know, a whole topical talk that I need to give. Um, so really, uh, maybe we just have like an open q and I mean, you guys are, everyone really has a sense of what I do and the book is about the same stuff. Um, so maybe I just leave it open-ended, yeah. I'm curious, like, given, um, especially given how the um, seasons have been a little different lately, you know, yeah. the timing's been a little off, and how the this, this spring is behaving this year, I'm curious what, what, um, what is this, the 15th of April or something like that? or? What's April? What's the, what's mid April looking like for you on your homestead? What do you what do, what are your priorities right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were all just planting walnuts. Uh, this is my apprentice group, by the way. Pretty much everyone came. It seems like um, I do this every year, this time of year, and these guys, folks, come from kind of mostly the U.S., sometimes beyond, but mostly the northeastern U.S. to learn. Um, what we're doing in this season. And so that's this, this I'll just mention that this group already kind of has a sense of, of um, what we're doing. We were just all working all day a lot today and yesterday. And it's basically tree-based this time of year because it's dormant season still. So we can move trees around before they wake up. Um, that's not all we're doing, but that's like a big emphasis. Like I call this planting season because it's the time we can move trees and get bare root trees in the ground. So that's kind of the main thing that we're involved with, although we were also doing some erosion control in the wa uh, water course work today, pond overflow stabilization, um, opening the garden. You know, it's really an opportunity to do everything before the grass starts growing and you can't see anything. Like you can really, get at a lot of everything. It's very accessible, though it's pretty muddy right now compared to normal. Not that it's not normally somewhat muddy this time of year, but it's gotten, it's been basically so wet since last July. Um, so that's the main push is to just do anything that requires moving plants and accessing the ground before the grass gets up and things disappear. And also, you know, things like seed starting, we're starting to a lot of this time of year, uh, getting the garden ready. That's, I'd say, the big focus, you know, um, just getting ready for the whole summer season. There's a bunch of, um, we'll do some sawmilling this week, probably. Uh, we're doing pruning, it's still the end of pruning season, so we're doing a lot of pruning and grafting. Um, we won't be able to do that really throughout the summer as well. Those are, I'd say those are the main things. Um, so is, is it preferable to prune in the um, winter as opposed to now? Like yeah, dormant, dormant season is when most of the pruning um, wants to happen before the trees wake up. So really just another week or couple weeks, depending. Um, you can do some summer pruning to suppress the tree's growth, but Mostly, we don't want to suppress the tree's growth, so we're doing it in the winter. When I say winter, I mean, you know, it's still winter for the trees, basically, right now, but that's changing fast. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the trees are waking up, some of the berries are waking up, but apples, we do a lot of work with apples and pears, they're still pretty much just, you know, just stirring. So... Yeah, I mean, this is a, a good time of year also to look at all the water flows and do like get ready for summer rainstorms, you know, because you can see everything. It's like once the vegetation comes out, 
it's like our access gets kind of limited in terms of what we can see in the landscape and what we can get at. Things get really hidden by all the grass and to some extent the leaves too. Um, yeah. We also get really busy with other things like moving the cows or doing veggie gardening, um, carpentry or building projects that want to happen when the weather's warm. So this is kind of a nice window, you know, to, to get a lot of that other stuff done. At the same time, it is hard to do some stuff because it's been so wet. So, yeah, Jeff. You're really strategic and mindful about how you spend your time. Why do you decide to, you know, use it to write a book? Um, it just, just compelled to get it all down on paper. You know, uh, it, yeah, I think, I guess I'm, I'm kind of uh, tend to just want to record stuff. Take fo I tend to take photos. And I used to write a bunch for a journal in Vermont. And so I had a bit of writing to work from. And then I guess the idea, I actually had proposed a book on bio, on, um, not bio, on veg straight vegetable oil fuel systems for diesel engines, like driving on a used vegetable oil and diesels which I used to do a lot of, and I am glad I didn't, I don't, can't imagine writing a whole book on that, but I, I was thinking that would be a book like years ago. I was like, oh, that's an interesting topic. So I proposed that book and it didn't get accepted, which I'm glad in retrospect. Um, and so I guess the idea of just like, oh, you could just write, you could just put together a bunch of info to share stuck with me, you know, especially if it's like not info that's out there. You know, I mean, some of what's in this book is out there, but a lot of it's like somewhat unique. It's not like a typical topic that is covered already. So, yeah, I feel like, um, yeah, just a, just something I'm compelled to do, I guess. I don't really like looking at the computer, so it's like a lot of computer. You know, it's not like doing it was super fun. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather do other things. Yeah. That's why I asked. yeah. No, I mean, it's computer work. I mean, the book writing itself, and I hate being on the computer. You know, I really don't want to type on the computer. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I think it's worth it. To, to, you know, it just seems worthwhile. Um, but it's also good that it's done. You know, I don't, I don't want to be like an author. Oh, every few years, you know, continuously. Um, it's a good resume for our design business, too. I mean, it wasn't a reason, it wasn't a driving reason to do it, but it's, a, it's, it's nice to have as like, uh, it's better than a, any other portfolio, you know, in terms of like, all right, if you wanna know what we do, like, this is kind of the best example of it. It's better than like a website yeah, it's a good business card, exactly. Um, and so it has helped us get certain design projects, but our design projects aren't really the, you know, they're not necessarily the main thing I do now anyway, either. So it was for 10, 15 years, but it's, it's not as much of our focus anymore. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's some reasons that I haven't quite identified as far as why to do it. Because I can think of as many reasons not to do it, but uh, it, it, I'm, you know, I don't regret doing it. I'm glad you did. Thanks. <laughs> I think my wife may be happy if I never had done it. I mean, because she, she dealt with me, you know, being busy doing this. You know. But, Any notable revisions that you made? That you yeah, to? between this and the last book. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot. Um, there's a lot of little like species recommendations that have shifted as we've gotten to see like peaches did really well for the first 10 years and then they pretty much have all died. So now in this book, I'm like, I don't regret planting peaches, but I'm not really planting more. Um, and I didn't know that, you know, 10 years in. So a lot of stuff showed it's 
showed what it's really capable of and how well fitting it is in between like year 10 and 20. Um, so there's species stuff like that, like peaches, um, medlar, quince, you know, like little different specific species. Hey, those aren't, those didn't really work out here. Uh, the yacon, that project. Rice ended up being a lot of weeding, a lot of work after a long time, after five years. Um, and then, so the things that are really proven species-wise and systems-wise are like still in here and still like, hey, this, this we recommend. I think Hugo culture, like that's not something I'm gonna do more of like burying logs, building up gardens over wood. The, I don't know how much I talk about in this book, but I, I think I don't, I say it wasn't the most successful thing um, because it wasn't. Um, and then there's some stuff that's weeded out, like different design graphics that I don't think were that important to make room for the new stuff. Um, and then there's a bunch of new stuff, like kid, like children, you know, because I have a six, seven-year-old now. So there's some ideas around integrating kids in landscape, homestead, farm work. Um, and a, more on greenhouses and managing what we call zone four permaculture. There's a lot on, which there was nothing on in the first book, which is um, what we were doing, was that yesterday, the day before? Working in further out from the home area, very light touches on the landscape where you're basically encouraging hundreds of trees in places you rarely ever go, except maybe once or twice a year kind of wild tending. That's got a sizable focus in here. Um, yeah, a lot more on the wood stove, hot water systems, more detail there. But yeah, it's like 30% new stuff and then all adjusted. On the greenhouse topic, that mound you built like 10 years ago, you're running the tubing in. Yeah. Is it hot air? Hot water. Was that successful? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's an update on that, and that is that pretty much I wouldn't do it again because it was a ton of work to get hot water when you can make hot water with your wood stove, which I do say is awesome. Like, that's proven over and over, and it was great in the last book, and it's even better in this book. Like, you, low hanging fruit if you want resiliency, it's like here, hot water with your wood stove, have a high efficiency wood stove. Um, but that Jean Payne mound was like a ton of work to get hot water that I realized I didn't even need that hot water for the greenhouse, it didn't help the greenhouse. Like heating your greenhouse in the winter seems like a good idea, right? If you can get free heat, it'll grow the plants. But I learned that it doesn't really work that way because it's so dark here in the winter. You don't have enough light. So even if some of the power companies like, hey, here's a free thousand kilowatts a month, heat your greenhouse for free. It's not gonna really give you much benefit. Unless you plug in lights, which I don't, you know, I'm not interested in turning electricity into some kale. It's just like not a great trade. So the heat wasn't even, like didn't even help to have the heat. And it was a ton of work to get it. You know, I mean, big project, making, putting tubing in the mound. And then there's other, some other stuff. Like if you're gonna do that, cause you are in the compost business, which could make sense. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense for everyone, but for my context, if you're a compost maker and you could, and you are a greenhouse producer too, and then the spring that heat could be really useful, then maybe it might make sense but um, you would want to not put the loose tubing in the mounds. You'd want to kind of have it in like a cattle panels or something where all the tubing is contained so you can just pull it all out. Because getting that tubing out was a total pain in the butt. Which is obvious if you think about it, but like we had seen the videos of Jean Payne doing it where you put the tubing in and no one ever said, hey, this is gonna be a nightmare to take out, so we're just kind of like, let's just do it even though we're like, yeah, this is gonna maybe be a difficult thing to undo. And it was. Made for a good winter after a shower. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, a couple times. 
you know, it's a good experiment. We got a lot of good compost out of it, which we could have gotten without the tubing. But, you know, in the first book, it was like try tons of stuff. Last 10 years, it's like figure out what really works and dial it in. And don't just try so many things. And I'm, you know, I also don't have the time. I have a child now. Like, I can't just go married. You know, I was just like s somewhat mostly had like less responsibilities for those first 10 years. I could just try whatever. So now it's like, let's, let's figure this out. Dial it in. Yeah. Do you have any pet projects that you're, or, or projects that you're really excited about for the spring and summer that you're, you're getting ready to work on? You know, the beekeeping I'm always excited for because it's just so difficult. <laughs> um, I'm always excited for the veggie gardens to just get a fresh new opportunity to do it better. Have you done beekeeping before? Yeah, yeah, I've been beekeeping mostly for 10 years or so, 11, um, seriously trying to really get it for seven or eight. Um, make, I made a forge in the last couple months, just a little home forge, so metal work, like a blacksmithing. Pretty excited to make some tools. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that's, there's so many things you can do with scrap metal and a forge. Like, it's, it's around here. yeah, ever there's mountains of metal good metal yeah. and uh, yeah it's pretty baseline kind of like I feel like I should have gotten into that a while ago but just getting around to it those are some of them yeah yeah Josh what do you think the next 10 years of your kind of property is going to evolve into I don't really know um, it's going to be more, it's, every year it's more and more about processing, right? Because everything's getting mature. So now it's like, well, what do we do with more of this berry and this fruit than we can eat? I'd like to not just see it fall on the ground. Because um, that's a lot of work to process it all. Um, so that's a big thing now. It's just, yeah, how to, like, I mean, we, we just plant, as you are seeing, all of you guys are seeing, we're, we're planting way more food than we need for a family because we have the space and we're just like, there's so many reasons to do it. Um, it's better than just letting it turn into an old field with poplar and birch, which is the whole New England is, has plenty of poplar and birch. Let's plant oak and walnut and chestnut and all the stuff that's great for people and wildlife. So we keep doing it, but yeah, it's like, it's getting to be dozens and dozens of times more than we can consume. So, yeah, trying to figure out how to, how to get that to, to be, uh, reach a value, you know, like whether it's with other people or wildlife or both. I mean, wildlife always takes advantage of it to, to a large extent. Um, but we'd like to see a lot of that go to people too. We've, you know, we invite our neighbors over sometimes for picks, pick your own sea berry or pick your own Nanking cherry. But people are also busy. So like, even if you give away food, it doesn't mean people are gonna come get it. It's kind of wild. And like, who, what's Nanking cherry? Like, no one knows about that. If you're like free steak, like probably people would come over. <laughs> <laughs> We're not giving away free steak, but yeah, or free beer or something we don't have extra of, but um, yeah, I don't know. What's the next 10 years look like? I mean, it's, it's you know, I think it's a lot of my, around my, my Jovi, my son, you know, it's just like how to keep him um, involved in the system, get, keep teaching him responsibility, you know, around, around what we're doing. Um, I guess I don't really have any expectate, you know, particular visions of exactly how that will go. Just keep it manageable, it's my main interest. Keep it organized. Um, so keep, keep up with the systems. A self-serving question, are you getting rid of trees? This, since you're moving trees right now? Are, we what? are, you, are you getting rid of trees? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, ha some people are coming over to buy some trees on Saturday. I'm giving some, giving some plant material away, 
Yeah, um, we're not really doing any big tree sale like we did a few years ago. Um, more so, we're just moving trees where there's a lot of to where there's less on the property. Mm -hmm. We don't have any big planting project this year for clients like we have had in the past. Two years in a row there, we had like big multi-week plantings. This year, there's not. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in trees, you know, let me know. Bring a five gallon bucket kind of thing, tap them? Yeah, there, there's a variety of stuff. Like you could, there's stuff to dig. There's tons of plant material. Um, yeah, just depends on what it, what it is you're looking for. We've, we've managed to thin out some of our big nursery in the field, but then there's some areas where there's a lot still. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you could choose just like one sentence or one topic from your book for all the children in elementary school to, to hear, do you have something in mind? Um, I think that's just what, when I think of that age group, I don't know what topic I would pick, but topic or what about the book would... Like if you were to read a section of it to them, like what would you choose? I think about how cool trees are. Um, but it's still a little heady for that age group, I think. I don't know if there's anything in here that would really resonate with kids that age, like directly, but I think I could interpret, um, interpret some of it. I, I think the message that you can, um, you can like make a super cool world on your property, like an um, awesome place because of how you want to do it. You know, like create an awesome thing. Uh, it's like a kids make stuff, you know. Um, like make a Garden of Eden by just trying to do it. That that's like, encur encourage that. And say, you know, you can do that. In your whole process, was there something that truly surprised you? Or something unexpected? Oh yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things and that's the, kind of the best part. Yeah. That, that's, that is, that's the coolest thing in some ways. Um, there's been so many things. In the beginning, there was like, we couldn't get one area to grow anything. Like there was an area of the original site that hadn't been mowed in probably 20 years. And it's just like, um, just a wet, like a barrens, you know? Ferns and club mosses, you know? Like almost like if an area was quarried and then left, you know, just unproductive, wouldn't produce any Mater plant material. And uh, I, it was uh, very south facing. So I was like, this should be good. You know, this should do stuff, make some value. And it's also super bedrocky, thin. I mean, there was a lot of reasons it wasn't doing anything. And then um, one day I spilled yellow blossom sweet clover in that area out of the back of my truck. And like, I realized that only like six weeks later because this stuff came up like four feet. Maybe it was eight weeks later by the end of the summer and I was like, I had to trace back what happened here. Like, this is totally different. And then, okay, I'm gonna start sowing that plant. You know, like this plant's amazing. Um, there's been a lot of things like that. And then making swales there and growing sea berries and really having it be very productive. And now we're gonna go there tomorrow and we're just gonna be pulling out our saws and cutting down trees. Like now the place is, you know, we figured out how to help make it activate, activate it. Um, those things have been cool. And then, I mean, there's so many surprises. Today I was explaining to these guys how choke cherry, I wanted to cut down this whole choke cherry patch that's like a weed outside our place. And it just seemed like a out of control zone, also south facing. So I figured, you know, we should, like I had an idea we should be doing this or that with it, like growing something that we thought we'd want, like apples or pears or berries, because I didn't, I just figured choke cherry is just a weed. And then at some point I learned choke cherry is really awesome to eat, dried. I know that sound, may sound weird, but it really is dried, amazing food. And I only learned that because I was in this primitive skills program. Like no one really eats dried choke cherry. I mean, 
native peoples did. Plenty of people did, but not, nowadays it's like not something people eat mostly. And I took this primitive skills program and they, they gave us uh, dried choke cherry one day. And I was like, this is amazing. And then, you know, got home and then over another couple years was like, you know, these things are, oh yeah, like saw the fruit in the fall. I mean, I knew the trees were there, but I just didn't have the time to look into them. And then now we were like actually promoting them. Like this patch I was going to cut down, wanting to cut down, never got around to it. Today we were thinning them and like helping them along. Those are cool surprises to me because that's just like my own knowledge was the limiting factor there. You know, the land was doing it already, you know, for us, so to speak. Like, you know, we just weren't in realization of the value that was there. Those are, there's been a bunch of those and those are, those are cool surprises. But yeah, ton, tons of surprises. We had a baby, both times we baby cows were born recently on the last two years on the property, we weren't expecting it at all and that just seemed pretty amazing. Uh, I mean, one time the cow wasn't supposed to even be pregnant, but she gave, she obviously was. <laughs> those are cool surprises. Um, yeah, there's been a lot. Yeah, yeah, some of it feels pretty miraculous. Um, yeah. The, the wildlife that comes, uh, that interacts with it, like now we're seeing on the original site, oak trees that I didn't plant that are the, the offspring of stuff we did plant. And that's really cool because like we worked really hard to get oaks to just grow. There's no oaks around here, except there's some red oaks, but basically not even many of those. And we plant like five types of oaks. And now that ecosystem is like somewhat going of its own accord. And that's really neat. So the first round did not go well or did it go well? No, I mean some did, but like they take a long time to produce. So, you know, we're, at, we're just getting into the period where the system is planting itself, so to speak, you know, because some like oaks can take 10 years to bear or, or more. Um, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of neat surprises, especially with springs. Like the first site, there's new springs, the water. We, we do a lot of work to slow spread and sink water to keep water on site from rushing off. And that actually builds up the water table over time, which shouldn't be that shocking, but it does, you know, it really d does in a meaningful way in a whole, in over many acres. And so that what that does is new springs start popping out of the ground. And that's like, whoa, you know, that's kind of, kind of a superpower, <laughs> like make a new spring, but it's really not that hard. It just takes time. Um, yeah, you'll see, we're, you, these guys haven't been to the other site tomorrow, but we're gonna be there and um, it's like super wet now, which is also challenging. Yeah, but you hear stories about how when the first Europeans got to this region, it was soaking wet everywhere. Like everything was so much wetter. There were springs, like there's so many less springs now. The landscape's really dried out, which it would with all our roads and draining of, a lot of what humans have been doing is draining, you know, causing water to rush off of this place and leave. Just think about beavers alone, beaver activity. I think there was the size of like Connecticut. In the United States, there was an area the size of Connecticut or maybe bigger of just beaver impoundments at European contact. Like, like essentially another Great Lake of water, of all the beaver dams, all the beaver ponds combined, wetlands, ponds. So, and the beaver were basically almost exterminated, you know, quickly. So all those waterways, you know, we just, so much water was held in the landscape, you know, and um, we, I know why they, you know, it's, uh, it's, you can see why people drain land because you can farm it more norm, in more industrial ways. You can use the land more industrially, but there's a lot of benefits to having all that water. Yeah. Speaking of beavers, 
what's your relationship with them? Have they been on your land at all? Oh yeah, yeah. We've had we've put a lot of hours into work trying to work with the beavers and also trying to battle like battling them a bit. Yeah, it, down in the bottom pond. Yeah. Um, they would dam it up. We had to make this thing called the beaver deceiver. Like, we, yeah, we've had to do a lot of stuff to w try to work with them. Now they're gone. They left, like, they weren't there when we moved back, when we moved in. And then they came about five years later, and then they were like four years, and now they haven't been there for two years. No, now they're, they left two years ago. Like, I actually found a couple dead beavers. Like, they, some, I don't know if a disease hit them or something. Like, they have a scary disease. Uh, but I think Jeff saw them. Oh, they're, they're back. Really? Yeah. So there's one in the bottom pond now? Okay, I was, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Okay, so now, yeah. I haven't seen one down there in two years. Uh, yeah, but they were, yeah, it's a great place. They kind of outstrip their food supply and then leave. But we saw two dead ones, so that was, I just thought, kind of weird. And it wasn't like eaten, you know, eaten at all. So it was like something killed it that did seem like a predator. Um, I don't know. There's a lot. We, we spent hours and hours trying to keep them from, you know, we don't want them sending water certain places. Uh, but we value them, you know, big time. So I don't want to. If I was going to shoot, like me shooting a beaver would feel like I'm not, I haven't figured out how to, some really important things. Yeah, the work, the work we were doing this morning to kind of learn how to slow down the water, uh, I feel like there's so much to learn from the beavers mm -hmm. who also do that. I was wondering, because your property does seem like beavers have been around there, because there's so much wetland. And yeah, that bottom pond was probably a huge beaver wetland for thousands of years before European contact. I mean, most definitely. That's just a very low, low, low gradient watershed, which is where they just make terrace after terrace of water. You know, Granville Gulf would all be, a, that would be a series of, late, of small lakes you notice how they undo the beaver activity in there? What? V-trans. The, the, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They well, flood the road there. The yeah, I mean, they have to do it if you want to drive through. But There's it shows you, right it, yeah, it shows you what it would be. I mean, if they don't go in there with a big long reach excavator multiple times a year, the road would be underwater. And that whole water, top of Mad River watershed to the White River watershed would just be terraced ponds all the way down almost to Warren Falls until the water's really rushing fast and down till it's rushing fast in Granville. They did do quite a bit of work on the, on the top in, in the winter. I was yeah. Like oh, yeah. Because yeah. the road was crusting. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It gives you an appreciation of just how they would have held so many, like millions of gallons in the top of the watershed. And that has a lot of flood control value, you know. Um, but now with our highways, you know, they can't tolerate that. So they keep, they keep ripping them down, all the berms and stuff. There's a lot of nice beaver activity down at the bottom, though. Yeah. Yep. They're, uh, right. Yeah, I've been noticing that lately. Big trees. big trees, yeah. Yep. That's actually Alder Brook. Did you know that? That's not the white. Right. Yeah, it's right we're near where you live. So the white comes out of your zone. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that until the last few years. Like the main river goes up away from 100 there, where Mike kayaks. Mm -hmm. I went once with him, twice. I almost. I almost died the second time. I'm not going to do it again. I've, only, I've seen one guy who goes out during the storms. Dude, it's crazy. I, I shouldn't have gone, but he's like, yeah, you, you can come. <laughs> and then later I was like, that was, that was bad, right? Like I went down that waterfall upside down. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's not so good. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going with you again, dude. <laughs> like, Shine the side up. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no. Given the job of being the official water meter, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You text him if you see it. Yeah. Yeah, you're always going by it. 
Yeah, that's the main stem and the white coming out of the mountains there. So are you, are you um, since you were mentioning you have quite a surplus, or you maybe will have quite a surplus of food, are you, do you have intentions of, I don't know, like, are you trying to figure out how to, how to monetize it, how to put it in the farmer's market, or? Yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, my day job is like consulting and, you know, it's like I'm, I don't need to and I'm busy doing like other work. So it's not like a primary thing, but um, yeah, I mean, it kind of feels like a business opportunity for someone, not necessarily me or maybe me. I make a lot of ciders and meads, like ferments, which utilizes some of it. Um, you know, be fermented beverages, brews and stuff. What have you found has been the best uh, fruits to integrate with your meats? Blackcurrants, aronia, blackberry, blueberry, uh, flowers especially. We actually like flower meads even maybe more than fruit meads. Yeah. The, the tannic stuff, apple, I mean apples, you know, are great, hard cider. Um, not, not meads, but um, yeah, really strong, flavorful berries and, and fruits. And meads, honey-based? Honey, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had made a ton of cider last year. We had so many apples, which was crazy, because that frost. Shouldn't have had any. How much honey but. are you producing a year now? Um, it, it varies wildly because the bees are so difficult. Um, but I mean, it varies between like, oh, sometimes maybe nearly none or 50 pounds to like a couple hundred pounds. I mean, I only keep two to eight hives at any given time. And what's the spatial sort of constraints to having hives? Like how many hives can you have per? That's very subjective to the yeah. amount of flowers and fruits there, I assume, but. I mean, in some ways, bees are one of these exceptions where you could have a lot of beehives if you lived on half an acre because they leave your property to go f do their farming. So there's nothing else you farm that's you're farming off your property, you know. You, your livestock leaves the site, comes back with the value. So, um, it's more like, I guess, like more like how much, how many colonies can you have given a, like if you're in the woods, like we are up here, generally, th there's not as much bee food as down in the Champlain Valley. So that's the constraint is how forested we are up here, pretty much. Like all the beekeeping commercial in Vermont's in the Champlain Valley, except for one, pretty much one operation, maybe two but like 90% of the honey being made or more is just in the Champlain Valley because they need field, like clover, especially field. There's flowers in the field. There are flowers in the forest, but right now, like red maple, but there's not a whole lot in the summer. You know, like basswood, there's not much basswood around here. Black locust, we've probably, planted more black locust on our site here than is in the whole county. There's not much of it. A thousand trees, you know, that's not that much honey, like bee food. Um, so yeah, forested regions are pretty minima, minimal. But people have kept bees in, in forested areas definitely for a long time. But you can't keep as many hives. So honey on your property now, are you finding that you have more wildlife too? Like, you know, come to check it out? Uh, yeah, to some extent, but it's surprising. I think there's less deer around here than there was 10 years ago. Just, it just seems like the deer herd, unrelated to what we're doing, but there's just less of them. Um, yeah, I mean, we have more like, we have more rodents and stuff, um, which isn't so great. <laughs> We do have bears, but I don't know if we have more than we did, you know. The domestic livestock, like the, I think the cows tend to keep some wildlife kind of away, mm. maybe. Like, de like deer, I don't think like to integrate, you know, in 
be near the cow, the cow influence, it seems. But and there's we have fen you know it's fencing up and stuff that kind of discourages them. Um, way more bird life though. That eats our berries, especially. I'm psyched for to see more turkey life though, as we, as a lot of more food be, is, especially fruits are produced. Yeah. Oh, well, we haven't seen really a ton of that yet. Location, if you're buying property, what would you say are a few components for the <coughs> south facing soil fertility, uh, spring? Mm -hmm. What are a few things, I'm sure they're in the book, uh, I should be thinking? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. There's a lot of, what's that? Yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's somewhat dependent on your own goals, you know, which vary. You know, some people, it's like, I want to be able to walk my kids to school, so that's part of their goal set. Some people, like, I don't want to hear a road, so that's very different. Um, so it's goals dependent, so I can't say, you know, we, we, when we consult with people, the first thing we do is get a goals, you know, sheet so then I can adapt it. So, um, but I mean, as far as re if resiliency is a goal, which I imagine it is or you wouldn't be here interested in, you know, anything I do um, and regeneration, then yeah, good, good, good water. Good soil is important, but probably not as important as good water because you can't really change. If you're down in the bottom of a valley and have contaminated groundwater, you can't fix that. Whereas you can improve your soil over time. So I'd put water, there's a thing called the scale of permanence. Have you heard of that? Look that up because it's a very good way of thinking about how changeable features and processes of the landscape are scale of permanence. It's really, in some ways, a very baseline part of permaculture. And so things like slope, overall climate that you're in, those are things you know, you're not going to adjust. Cold, temperate climate, that's what this whole area is. Can't change that. But your microclimate you could change, to some extent. Um, you can change your soil, you can change your vegetation, you can change your buildings. But the groundwater, super hard. The angle of the slope, pretty hard. Depth to bedrock, pretty hard. So how do you design sort of swale digging? Is that very dependent on the watershed? Yeah, and soils and slope and what you want to grow. Yeah, but you generally want to yeah, it's very, it's very context dependent. Um, but there's some mistakes that most people tend to make that you can avoid pretty easily. Like don't make them too steep. Don't make like these big extreme mounds. Usually it's not a good idea. They want to be pretty subtle, you know, like a wave. Um, yeah, but there's, yeah, there's kind of a lot of variables there. You have in Moortown, and have you thought you didn't need that much over time? Are you happy you've had that much? Mm -hmm. Would you rather have more? Yeah. It's ten. Yeah, it's ten acres that site. Um, I've never really felt like we need more to do what we're trying to do. It's more like it's constrained by the kind of land it is. Like it's very wet and bouldery, and like it's not ag land. So we can't like hay, make hay or really even brush hog some of it. You know, it's like it's pretty, pretty rough, rocky and wet land to some extent. I mean, there's land that's more, that's more challenging, but it's, it's, it's not like smooth field land. So can't really manage it like with a tractor very well. It's a lot of hands on. So 10 acres feels pretty big then. You know, whereas a 10 acre flat field with a big tractor, you could keep up with that pretty easily. Um, 
Yeah, I've never felt like more land. We're not limited by how much land we have there. It's like just time, time on the land to, to manage everything. Um, but the, the quality of the land, I'd say, is more important than the size of it. You know, there's people that can grow way more food on two of the right acres than 200 forested, gnarly mountain acres. You know what I mean? That's like boulders. And <laughs> you could get some, maybe harvest timber if you can like drive a tractor through, you know, haul it. But even really rough land, that might even be challenging, you know. Um, Vermont kind of has all of that. It's got pretty soft ag land down in the valleys and stuff you could barely drive a skitter across to get logs out, you know. Um, and nowadays, more of the rough land is what's available. Like, there's less land available. And, and mostly the best sites are longer access, worse access. People are putting in, you know, there's still pretty good sites here and there, maybe, kind of, but like, it's often like, hey, you do a half mile driveway to get to that site. Super expensive. Across the yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like that 20 years ago so much, or even 10 years ago, you know. I mean, so it's, a, it's a not, a, not a great time to find land, <laughs> as you probably know, as anyone looking knows. But will it get war Will it get even harder, or will it get easier? I think it's easier to make the case that it's only going to get more difficult. Partially, I know you call it climate weirding, yeah. but how is climate change weirding going to play an effect on our microclimate in the valley going forward? Do you think? You mean like he right here in this valley, or just in Vermont? Stockbridge up to Wondering. Oh. I don't, I, mean, I don't think anyone knows. I mean, I, I think we should just be prepared for bigger, m bigger weather events, rain events, uh, rain on snow, bigger snows, although we haven't really seen that per se. Winter's not dead, though. No, no. But like, I mean, generally it used to snow, bigger snow events, you know, my first 10 years in Vermont than my last. Oh yeah, with oh yeah, yeah, right, totally. Um, yeah, I mean we have those big warm ups, those long, you know, kind of mild. Winters are pretty mild now, generally, more than they were. Um, I think just extreme, you know, just that's why I like to call it climate weirding. I think just just more extreme events. But I also think we blame, uh, we blame far more on, on the climate than is the climate's fault. It's mostly we do really stupid things as humans. And like we put roads in floodplains that flooded 2,000 years ago before a speck of fossil fuel was burned. They all flooded wildly and violently. <laughs> and they still flood wildly and violently. So it's you know, different topic, but like the weather's always done crazy stuff. I, I was reading Lincoln, Vermont history book last summer in when we were getting all these floods and like the, the floods in the 1800s were crazy in this area. They had nutty floods, like whole towns washed out. You know, this is the early 1800s. So before the industrial revolution, like, you know, there was no Exxon Mobil or anything, you know, just there was no climate change, but there was, you know, there was crazy weather. <laughs> yeah. So what's your take on, I'm not too astute in it, and sort of this topic, but yeah. what are we heading out of the Hylocene and we're now in the Pyrocene? Uh, what is your general understanding? Is that very... I, I don't, I mean, that's not something I study a lot in terms of like geologically or, or, or like, um, yeah, like, climate epochs where we're supposed to be going. Yeah, I mean, I've read some books about it, where, but we were supposed to be going into an ice age around now, according to like the paleo climate record. So I read this interesting book that he talked, he's a paleoclimatologist, he says all the fossil fuels we burned 
warmed the earth a bunch and basically staved off that ice age, which his, his thesis, he's a professor in the Adirondacks, at maybe Paul Smith's college or something. And he's like, that's cool, that's good, but we should stop now, like, like we did enough. And because ice ages are really bad for like living things, like that's like the biggest extinction going is when we have an ice age. So we don't want an ice age, but we also don't want like hardcore warming. Uh, although I think the more I look into it, the it's ways to make a case that warming, even crazy warming like 5C, would be way better than an ice age. <laughs> Which, for yeah, for a lot of the Earth, like the world really contracted like to like lower latitudes, and the ice caps they got really big. I mean, the ice went down to Long Island. That's like what 30. Five latitude, like pretty far down. So, and, and it wasn't many types of life happening on that, you know, on the ice. I mean, um, so it's interesting, you know, ice ages are definitely not, not good for most people <laughs> and most life. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm a little less concerned about climate shifts than I used to be. And I was like way into this stuff in, high, in like starting in 25 years ago. I spent a whole summer on an ice sheet doing glaciology and climatology before you know, anyone was really talking about climate change it was 25 years ago. It was just like, I mean, it was a topic, but nothing like now, you know. And, and I was getting really concerned about it then. We saw, you know, receding glaciers in Alaska where I was, you know, signs like, Mendenhall Glacier, watch for falling ice, and there's, the ice is like half a mile that way, you know, like the old pretty classic photos of like huge receding ice fields. And so for me personally, I was like super like, I was way more concerned then about climate change than I am now, the more I look into it. Um, I'm more concerned about just all the stuff where it, like, we just keep building highways in the floodplains or ma not managing water well. Um, you know, shunting water off the land, you know, causing our own floods, like really, or, or exacerbating them when we could really do a lot to minimize them. You, you see, you, it sounds like you see some of my videos. I made a video about how that, the flooding in Vermont this summer, the only thing it did was mess up the valley, the, a very small, like a 1% of the state was really like messed up by those floods, but it's where we put all our stuff. You know, like, like every, like Montpelier, it's like in the floodplain. I mean, there's 99% of the state was basically unperturbed by all that rain. And a lot of it, you could say, actually benefited. Like all the, most of the hillsides, everything above the floodplain, it not only didn't get damaged by most of that rain, but a lot of it actually was like really stoked. Like the trees had a huge growth year tons of nitrogen for fertility. So it's wild, like we had a hellacious year for the humans, you know, like Vermont spent, lost billions of dollars, I think. Three flood events in one year, like three big floods, huge infrastructure damage, 125 was, you know, landslid and all over the state that happened. But that's just like a sliver of the landscape where that's happening. And, but it's where we do all our stuff. So that's who's, who, who's, you know, who's, who's. I shocked to uh, be walking around Montpelier recently and they have like a plaque, you know, by one of the yeah. pictures and it shows some photographs and it shows all the markings of the different years. Mm -hmm. I had no idea it's flooded so many times. <laughs> it's flooded for, you know, since, since time and more, since before. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, the whole, right, right. But it's, it's in a, it's where three rivers come together. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's a it's essentially a floodplain terrace where they built the city and Not a great choice. yeah, a good place to farm and every now and then lose all your crops, but call it worthwhile because the soil's so good. But yeah, not a place for a city. So yeah, I just think that the seemingly endless human 
short-sightedness is the real crisis. You know, remember in, when we got the, the, both Irene and the most recent big flood when Montpelier flooded? I had a friend who came to town and he had to go to New Hampshire to rent a car. I was like, oh, you couldn't rent a car in like Burlington? He's like, no, all the cars are, all the rental car companies are, are, have no cars. I was like, why? Because so many cars were damaged in the flood. So these, the people living in Montpelier like had to rent cars because their car was flooded. How easy would it be to not have cars flooded? You just, the city be like, hey, a flood's coming. Like they predicted it like three days in advance. Drive your car 10 feet up the hill and it won't be flooded. And we didn't even do that. So it's like, that's the crisis to me. You know, <laughs> I mean, we knew it was coming. Like, like, they were like, yeah, Vermont's gonna get 10 inches of rain. I was like, that, the NOAA weather prediction's amazing. Like, it's not like an earthquake, you know? They don't know that's really gonna happen. The floods are incredibly well predicted, which is a highly advantageous <laughs> as far as doing something about it. Yeah, this is amazing, like, all those cars. Like, Montpelier, literally, if you just, like, get five people and push a car 100 feet, you'll get it out of the floodplain, you know. It's, it's, you don't have to go far. And that happened also in Irene. So you'd think that, that might have been something we might remember, too, you know. And, I mean, I don't know if this is going to be on local TV. I think it is with the filming, because maybe some people from the state tune into it, but... Um, there's hazard mitigation mechanisms for dealing with this. And none of those seem to have been activated. Like the city of Montpelier issues parking bans when a snowstorm is predicted. They say you can't park downtown because we're gonna have to plow everything. So they could have just issued a parking ban for the flood. I don't know. Anyone out there on the TV who's watching this can tell me how, why that didn't happen? Like, it's like, Seems it's free, you know, because it's downtown that floods. So if you issue a parking ban downtown, save like 200 cars. I don't know. At this point, I don't expect anyone's going to do anything about it, because I said all this stuff 11 years ago in Irene, you know, like hey, we could, we could avoid some of these problems. So. I know I'm gone way beyond your question, but like to me that that's like interesting because we could do a lot and we're just choosing not to. So it's kind of like, uh, how, why can't we be more adaptive? You know, um, and I don't have any answer. For, you know, so I'm just like, I'm happy to, uh, help help with that but it doesn't seem there's much interest really uh, state wise in actually engaging even the topic so the climate adaptation climate mitigation versus just stop the weather from changing you know there seems to be way more interest in trying to fight fight the weather which seems kind of wild um but Maybe that's like a, there's some, sto there's some lesson there. <laughs> I don't know what, what it is. It's kind of biblical, right? Or Shakespearean, <laughs> like something like, like tragic comedy or, you know. But I think it's, I think it's hopeful because we could do a lot if we chose to. Um. But yeah, floods are no joke. We're in, we flood like quick here. We're really, this mountainous landscape, even the Champlain Valley is nothing like here, like up in the mountains here. And we were spared here this summer, huh? Compared to all everywhere around us. I mean, I don't put my foot in my mouth, but we, we didn't really get it bad. We just got missed. I mean, not 125, but like right here. Okay, yeah, yeah, you guys had like, that one storm, I saw it coming at us and it just sat over 125. But like Rochester and Stockbridge, the places that really took it hard in Irene were spared, fortunately, this summer. Although not Ludlow, not the Southern. They got Irene and then they got this and I think they got two, two floods this summer. 
I don't know if you guys went south on 100. I had some consults down there. It was crazy. It was like giant logs in all the fields. Yeah. Ludlow was like, looks like, looked like a bulldozer drove through, like, like a fleet of bulldozers drove through town. <laughs> and Killington had like a landslide. But that's, you know, if there was no development on that mountain, there wouldn't have been a landslide there. Like, you know, all those high elevation roads, access roads, huge part of, of why the effects are what they are. It seems like some of the post-Irene work did help, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like thicker culverts. And yeah. Rock in the ditches and ended up with pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. The bigger culverts, I think, did a lot. Mm -hmm. But I have a friend who's very, very tuned into the weather, and he was hearing VPR talk about how the Mad River Valley did so well because of our because of the Irene work. But he's like, the Mad River Valley didn't get very heavy rain. This, you know, it also didn't, like it's super localized. Mm -hmm. And the Mad River watershed avoided just major rains this summer. I mean, comparatively, just didn't open up there. Like it did right over 125. I mean, it's so variable. That storm when Middlebury and 125 really got trashed, they got six inches, seven inches there. We got two and a half. And we're like two miles as the crow flies from where there was like landslides. And it just, it just burned itself off over 125. So these microclimates are intense. But um, the early people really knew what they were doing, putting everything up in the hills, I think. You know, they didn't have heavy equipment, so they were like, just stay away from the river. You know, they couldn't move three-ton boulders to armor, to keep the river where they want to keep it. So they're like, well, this river is moving everywhere all the time. Let's just not put our main thoroughfares next to it. You know, and then the store, so they were up on the hills for a hundred years. That's the whole town common story of Vermont, like all the agricultural commons. We have a project, actually there's a drawing of it in here called the Warren Commons about how to reinvigorate that as a town center. Because all the old high towns like Waterbury Center and Craftsbury Center, uh, and a lot of the original town commons are in great spots. They're, they're not in the floodplain, they're up on the hills. So even the first hundred years, we, we actually didn't, didn't do it wrong, really. But then we went to the river for power, for industry, for water power. And then the villages just kind of became cropped up there. And we got heavy equipment so we could put highways right through the valley. You know, that was the place to have the fast roads because they're flat. But now we're fighting those rivers every year. So, yeah, it's interesting. We were doing water course work this morning as the main lesson is like the water will eventually always win, but we have some, hopefully some massaging we can do. But yeah, I mean, we keep getting weather like this, like, and don't adapt. Like we're not gonna, we're, Vermont will be tanked economically. Like this summer was hellacious money, like economically on the, on the state. I don't know what, I don't know if you guys know the numbers, but it was like, we can't like lose like 10 highways every year, you know? Like they were what, fixing Bethel Mountain for like, what was that, like three months? You couldn't drive that road? Six months? Yeah, it was like wild. Irene was even worse, when that, what was it, one, 107, that was like, they had to open new quarries for that, to fix that road. Um, or open old quarries that hadn't been run in like 100 years to be closer. You know, there's so much stone put down. It's wild. It's really ironic that all that, that activity of fixing climate change makes more climate change, <laughs> right? If it's like the carbon that's driving it, well, all the diesel is what mops up after the storm. It was a crazy flat, you know, positive feedback loop there. Ski industry is like that too, right? You know, it's always squawking about how the skiing keeps being damaged by climate change, but like the carbon footprint of ski resorts is huge. I don't even know if golf is, compares, definitely higher than most sports, right? 
So that stuff, that's a <laughs> different topic, kind of, but it's like pretty wild. You ever heard of Protect Our Winters, the organization? Yeah. You can put the Protect Our Winters sticker on like heli ski, on the helicopter for heli skiing. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, anyway. Well, cool. Thanks for uh, doing a little, little session down here. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Yeah. Yeah, nice to be on the library. It's a nice spot. Yeah, there's a lot of cool his historical photos. You guys should, for those of you who aren't native New Englanders, like there's photos of the village here. The whole place is cleared of trees. Like look at some of those before you leave and then, and then look out the door and you'll look at that hillside. And there was none of these trees basically. Vermont was 80% cleared field. Now it's like 85% forested or something, 90. No, uh, mid 1800s. So the sheep craze was the 1830s, I think, 40s. Then we were like peak cleared for 20 years. Sheep craze plump, like it's like can it's like CBD boom bust, but like way bigger. <laughs> Same kind of thing. Just everyone did merino. There's three million sheep in the state. Three million. That's like how many sheep for each person. Three million divided by six, 500,000, basically 600,000. Many sheep per person. <laughs> and then, yeah, and so everything was sheep, everything was grazed. If you're somewhere, and even in New England, really, I think that's similar, but Vermont was pretty extreme. But if you don't know the past land use history and you're on the hills in New England, sheep pass, guess sheep pasture, you're almost always going to be right, at least for a period. And then it all just started regrowing slowly, especially in the uh, 1900s. I think that was one of the reasons the floods were so bad in early 1800s too, mid 1800s. Yeah, just yeah, they just, you know, complete topsoil washing down. There was like, I think 800 people that lived in on West Hill. Uh-huh, really? Yeah. How many are there? There's five now. <laughs> You can go up in the, like I've skied all around in the hills here with Mike, and you can be like way up, like, you're like, this is bona fide wilderness. Like I could probably live here for the summer and I don't think anyone would know I'm here. No one would go by. And there's like cemetery, you know, like surrounded by trees this big and there's gravestones. Like, wow, this cemetery? So, so there's a village up here. They didn't put cemeteries, you know, they didn't walk two miles to go to the five miles to go to the cemetery. There was people living everywhere. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty neat. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks guys. Good to see ya.